G'day, welcome back to The Factory. We're taking a deep dive on DIY I2C devices this week. We're working on the Picadev buzzer module, and this is a like a, a roll-it-yourself I2C device, because of course, you can't attach a buzzer to an mm -hmm. I2C bus, so we need a microcontroller in the mix to do the translation. We're gonna do a deep dive on both ends of the firmware. Of course, this device needs firmware so it can behave as a device, and we also need a really easy to use API in say MicroPython so that you can do really simple calls to like buzzer.tone 1000 Hertz and have it just work really easily. Let's get started. First, a bit of a production update. We have launched the Globit Matrix and the Globit Stick modules. So those are now available on Core Electronics. If you're leaving YouTube comments on like, oh, when are these gonna be available? They're done, they're up, the guides are shot, the articles are written, the matrices are available. This is the development environment at the moment. It does look a little bit complicated, but quite simply, we just have our device that we're programming in this programming fixture with a programmer connected to it and a Raspberry Pi P code that we can develop the MicroPython on. So in parallel, we can develop the C++ code that drives the module and also the Python API so that we can interact with it. And so this is what that looks like and a little more simply. We have a Raspberry Pi Pico connected to our buzzer module and they just share a two-wire I2C bus so that the Pico can send commands to the buzzer. Just briefly, if you're not that familiar with I2C, I2C is just a data interface similar to UART or SPI. It's just another data interface for devices to send messages back and forth. I've got the data sheet open for another device. This is the uh, this is the light sensor that we use in the Pika Dev range. And if I jump down to the register format, this is how a lot of I2C devices work. They're usually arranged into a structure of registers or command codes. You can kind of think of them as the same thing. On this device, for instance, we have from 00, 0 all the way up to 06. So there's seven different command codes. And these, you can kind of think of these as memory locations that can be written into or read from. For example, these first one, two, three command codes all address different size byte registers. So the first command code, you access a 16-bit register. The next one is another 16-bit register from zero to seven and eight to 15. But these both do a similar job. They both set the most significant byte and the least significant byte of a certain parameter. In this case, like a high threshold. So these are all write registers. And we also have a bunch of read registers. For example, if you just want to read the light intensity, then there is a register for that, a 16-bit register number four. And so this idea of memory locations and the size of that memory location is how a lot of I2C devices work. So let's just jump straight into a little two-turn demo. Here we have the user code for how you would make kind of like a, an E or siren where you have buzzer.tone at 1000 hertz to create a high tone and then again at 500 hertz to create a low tone. And if I run this script, we have a suitably annoying two tone. And so this is why we write APIs, because we want people to be able to just import PicoDev buzzer and then create a, a buzzer object. In this case, I'm calling it buzz and then call something like buzzer.tone. And here there are two arguments. There's the frequency in hertz and the duration of the tone in milliseconds. There's a short delay and then we play the second tone. So that means that every call to tone is going to do something with two parameters, the frequency and the duration. Taking a look at the definition of tone, I've just spaced it out from all the other codes so that it's on its own here. When we look at tone, we can see that we have two arguments come in, the frequency and the duration, just as before. The duration can default to zero in this case. We first up take that frequency argument and convert it into a byte string so that it can be easily passed along a data bus. And we do the same with the duration. This byte string for frequency is going to be two bytes long always. And of course that's going to set a maximum frequency that you can count to, but that's okay. Just a little bit of debugging here. We first print the frequency in Hertz and then we print the frequency as it is packed into a byte string. Then we make a call to the I2C write to mem function and push out that those frequency bytes and those data bytes. Now recall we were talking about registers before. This data has to go somewhere. Just as if we were going to write, say, a high threshold to this light sensor device, that would go to location number one. This frequency and duration information has to go to some location on our buzzer module. 
And so in that function, we have the, the register as one of the arguments. And the very first argument is the device address. You can have multiple devices on an I2C bus. And so of course, they all need a unique address. And that's how this function works. So if we were to look at this I2C data in the raw byte values, we would have the device address going out first. And, that, and, and for this device, that's just hex eight. We would have the tone command. And I've actually set that to be hex five because you know, of course we're making this device. So we get to choose what the registers mean. And then we have our two bytes for frequency data and that's in Hertz, and two bytes for duration data. And that's actually in milliseconds. And so that means that every call to the tone function will create traffic for one, two, three, four, five, six bytes on the data bus, no matter what. We always need to address a device, and we always need to tell the device what the command we're going to send is. And then we always need four bytes of data for this command. We have this debug string that I have in the works here. And you can see those prints coming out in the shell. Remember, we're printing the frequency in Hertz and also the byte string that that is being converted to. So in our first call to tone, we call tone with 1000 Hertz, 1000 in decimal and convert to hex. So 1000 in decimal converted to hex is 03E8. And that is exactly what we get here. 1000 in decimal converts to 3E8, nice. And of course, the same is true converting 500 to hex 1F4. That means that we know that when we call tone with 1000 hertz, our first four bytes of this message are 8, 5, and then what is that? 3 and E8. I haven't bothered debugging the duration, but it's basically the same. So if you're wondering where that address argument and that register came from, they're just defined in this class. We have the base address, which is the device address. In this case, that's the hex 8. And we have the register to create a tone, which is hex five. Okay, so we have this nicely formatted I2C packet of data coming out of our MicroPython device. And so that gives us the structure of what we wanna catch on the other end with this I2C device. Jumping over to the C code, I've ported this from a SparkFun project for their quick open log. And the structure is just, it's just beautiful. I think this is by Nate Seidel from SparkFun. So on your Nate, appreciate your work. We get to create our own memory map. Remember the register definitions for that light sensor, which were all laid out in some specific order. We get to define those here. So we create a memory map, which is full of things like the tone command, maybe setting the volume, even toggling an onboard LED. And it's in the register map instance that we get to set the value for those addresses. Remember in our API, the address for tone was hex five. Well, that is reflected here in the register map definition too. So this device is always sitting on the I squared C bus waiting for I2C transactions to come through. The main loop is basically empty. We're basically just checking if there's an update flag set. And if so, we can play some tone. So the device actually spends most of its time asleep waiting for interrupts. And those interrupts come through on the I squared C bus where we call wire begin. We then have attached receive and request events. And these are the events that handle dequeuing that data that's coming in and sending it to the right place. So when we receive some data, we call a function called receive event. So here it is, we have receive event and it also has the number of bytes received as one of its arguments. So we know how much data has come through on the I squared C transaction. And then basically it just sits there looping, dequeuing however much data is on the I squared C bus. We take that first byte and we know for certain that that is gonna be the register number that's being written to because we make the rules. So this first wire.read goes straight into a variable called register number. And then in a nested while wire is available loop, we just call, we repeatedly call wire.read and dequeue that into some array, which is just all the incoming data. Once all the data is dequeued off the bus, we just go through a loop that checks for a valid register number and looks for an attached function. So in this case, the register number or the command number is five. And so we loop through some list of functions looking for that register number. And if we find that number in that list, then it means we have a valid command and we're going to call that function. So we call that function and we also pass it all the remaining incoming data. What this means is if the first byte we receive is a five, which is the tone command, then the function that is called from the function map is the set tone function. 
Remember, the function gets passed into it all the remaining data from that I squared C transaction. And that's the four bytes that describe frequency and duration. So we take those first two bytes and pack them into a 16-bit number for frequency. And we take those second two bytes and pack them into a 16-bit number for duration. We set something called update flag to true, and then the function returns. It just goes straight into the main loop. The main loop sees that update flag is true, and so it calls to play the tone. And all play tone does is call the tone function, which on a certain pin connected to the buzzer, it plays the tone with some frequency and duration. These are global variables that were populated from the set tone function. Whew, and so that is, that is the journey of data from one end right to the other. This is how you can make an I squared C device. All the way on the left edge where we create commands in Python, all the way to the right edge where the data is dequeued and then sent to the correct functions to do the right things. In this case, unpack four bytes into two numbers and call the tone function. Okay, that's all great. Let's look at how we can implement a new command. This onboard LED is not just a power LED, it's user controllable. So let's implement the command that will turn that on and off. And I've already got an associated command in our functions table called set power LED. Set power LED takes in I squared C data and it basically just calls power LED, passing into it a true or a false. So all this is doing is checking if the data byte is a one or a zero. If the, if the data byte is equal to one, this will resolve as true. And if it's equal to anything else, it'll resolve as false. So it's basically calling power LED true false, and that will turn the power LED on and off. This is the logic for that. So that means our command to turn the power LED off would look like the device address, which is 0a. And then the appropriate register number, which is 0x07. Remember, 7 in hex was our LED control register. And then just a single byte to turn the LED on or off. To turn it off, we'll just send it a 0. So we need to send to device 8, address 7, the data 0. So I'll create that function in MicroPython. We'll define power LED. That takes the self command and x will be our input, which could be say true or false for on or off. All we need to do is send over I squared C to the device address, the LED control register, which I already have defined, which is reg LED, reg LED, and we'll take our input and convert that to a byte string by calling bytes on x. And now we've created that functionality in our API. Let's modify the, let's modify the example and call buzz.powerLED, uh, put in a false, and then on the other tone, we'll call buzz.powerLED true. Nice. Now the moment of truth, if I run this, you can see that we have a blinking power LED on board. How good. Now we're just talking about a buzzer here, a simple buzzer, you know, just play some tones. But this is obviously extensible to so many other projects. Now we've already got the PicoDev RGB module set up in the same way. So rather than writing to a tone, rather than writing to a frequency and duration location, we're writing to nine individual locations for the RGB data for each of these LEDs. You know, the sky's the limit. And so big problems just being lots of small problems, that's basically how you make an I squared C device. On the device side, you just create your, the functions that you, the functionality that you want in functions like the tone and the power LED function, you associate them with a register number or a command number. And on the MicroPython side of town, you take those definitions and you just throw data at them or read data from them. There's obviously a lot more going on in this project than just what I've shown you, but this is really the basic foundations of how to make your own I squared C device. So that was a bit of a deeper dive than I had initially intended, but this is something that I had always wanted to do. And I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who were curious about this idea themselves. So thanks so much, Nate, for this beautiful and extensible 
project template that we can all use to make our own perfect I squared C devices. Of course, Nate's origin project, the quick open log is available on GitHub already. This will go up once it's tidied up a bit and the, the product is live. But yeah, thanks for joining me on that deep dive into homebrew I squared C devices. And I hope you make something cool with it. Until next time, thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.